Welcome to the Nukipedia podcast by Junk Radio for 18 January 2023. Happy New Year! Coming up, we'll have the latest Fallout news, including layoffs at Microsoft and the demise of a controversial role-playing group. This will be followed by a Creech feature, where LS takes us to space to look at the Zetans. And then I'll talk with Brad from the award-winning audio drama Once Upon a Wasteland. <laughs> This is your Nukipedia Network News, I'm Agency. Today's headline is that there have been 10,000 layoffs announced for Microsoft Worldwide. As the owner of Bethesda, there has been some speculation that Bethesda employees will be included in this. There is still possibly some overlap in jobs from the Microsoft takeover, so this wouldn't be entirely unexpected. However, we have had confirmation that some Bethesda employees have been affected, including in public relations. We do not yet know the scale on how many Bethesda and ZeniMax employees are affected. If you are a former Bethesda employee tweeting out that you're looking for work, tag us in, we'll be more than happy to give you a boost, or an interview on a podcast. There have been media reports covering the apparent demise of a Fallout 76 role-playing group called the Enclaved Armed Forces, or EAF. PC Gamer reported earlier in January that the group issued a statement in January stating an intention to police Fallout 76, including targeting users of legacy weapons, trap camps, and anything else they deem toxic. They claim credit for taxing said users as well as using the report function for evicting others. Further revelations included in the article and on Twitter included bullying and demands to police members' friends lists, as well as encouraging members of other roleplay groups to disassociate with some users. On January 7, their website, Instagram and Twitter were all deleted, and their Redbubble account has since removed all of its products. No word on if they're continuing underground. Get your mask ready for Fashion Act! There'll be a real-life Fashion Act meetup in Helvetia, West Virginia, where else, on February 18 at 2pm. On to Starfield news now, rumours are spreading that the release of the game has been delayed yet again. We do know that it will not be part of next week's Xbox showcase, and a separate showcase will follow at an unyet determined date. Redfall, however, has remained in the showcase, although that may have slipped a few weeks, but we'll know for sure next week, January 25, when the showcase takes place. This is your Nukipedia Network news. If you have news that you would like us to cover, be it fan news or something else, make sure you email us at nukafalloutwiki. We'll be more than happy to give you a shout out. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Fallout Creature Feature, where we take a look at some of the most notable animals, monsters, and strange beings that inhabit the wasteland. I'm Ellis, and for our first creature feature of 2023, we'll be leaving the Wasteland, and Earth for that matter, for a double feature involving two of the most notorious specimens in the Fallout universe, the Zayton aliens and the monstrous results of their mad science, the Abominations. Picture yourself wandering the wastes, when suddenly you see some kind of bizarre metal machine along with a little green man nearby. Next thing you know, you see a blinding light and you're in a strange new environment. Welcome to the mothership of the Zaytans. The Zaytans are an alien race who have been observing Earth for centuries, based on the logs of some of the abductees that can be collected from the mothership Zeta DLC. These include college professors, U.S. senators, numerous American soldiers during the reclamation of Anchorage, and even astronauts. The Zaytans collect humans and other objects from Earth for research purposes, subjecting them to experimentation, cryogenic preservation, and general study. Eventually, the existence of alien life even became known to the U.S. government, particularly during the space race of the 1960s. It's even rumored that some alien technology discovered on Earth became the basis for a significant amount of weaponry that was developed by the American government and subsequently utilized by the Enclave. Just because the Great War occurred, and civilization was destroyed and had to be rebuilt over several centuries, didn't mean that the Zaytans were going to stop with their pattern of abductions. After the Great War, the Zaytans also began to abduct the mutated creatures that were starting to appear in the aftermath of the fallout radiation. These new test subjects have included supermutants, feral ghouls, Brahmin, and other wasteland inhabitants. Raiders and slavers were frequent abductees as well. There's even evidence that the Brotherhood of Steel and the Enclave are still aware of the active Zaytan presence within Earth's orbit. 
Zayton's society appears to revolve around work, with no visible evidence of personal interests or individual pursuits. The Zayton architecture is built for functionality, with the inside of their vessels showing sterility and uniformity. Despite their apparent lack of hobbies or outside interests, Zaytans have shown a fascination towards the giddy-up buttercup toys that can be found in the wastelands of Earth. The Zaytans themselves are your prototypical little green men, with large heads, dark eyes, and strange appendages for hands. They won't hesitate to attack or abduct unassuming wastelanders on sight, and because of their vast numbers, they're easily one of the deadliest, though subtler, species encountered in the franchise. The Zaytans seem to prefer subterfuge over direct action, only abducting small numbers of humans at a time, as opposed to a large-scale invasion of Earth, which, based on the ship and weapon technology they possess, would appear to be a relatively easy task for them. When they're directly confronted with enemies, they'll often have robots and automated turrets do most of the heavy lifting when it comes to defensive measures. Not to say that Zaytans aren't capable of defending themselves, utilizing arms such as atomizers, disintegrators, shock batons, and force fields. Their larger spacecraft also have massive laser cannons that are capable of very destructive power, particularly when aimed directly at the Earth. This is evident in the massive battle between ships when the Lone Wanderer and their crew take over Mothership Zeta. Perhaps the most horrific result of the Zaytans' mad science is the Abomination. Abominations are considered to be the greatest result of the aliens' experimentation. Half-human. Half-alien. The abominations have lost all sense of reason and will attack a target on sight with their extremely long arms. The abominations that the Lone Wanderer encounters are found in the biological research section of Mothership Zeta. There's evidence that the abominations killed the Zetans who created them, the hybrid monsters showing no loyalty and seeing anything that moves as a potential target. The Zaytans and their terrible creations serve as stark reminders that there's always something else beyond the various wastelands we find ourselves in. It may be beyond one wasteland. It may be beyond one continent. It may even be beyond the stars themselves. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fallout Creature Feature. For the Nukipedia Pipcast, I'm L.S. So this week on Public Occurrences, I'm joined by Brad from Once Upon a Wasteland. Brad, it's great to have you with us. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Now, normally I open my interviews with a completely different question, but first I hear congratulations are in order. You've walked away with no less than two Signal Awards for Best Writing, both the Listener's Choice and a Judge Awarded Silver Award. I know it's a bit of an obvious question, but what does this mean for you and the rest of the team behind the show? Yeah, I've actually been been thinking a lot about that, about the wider implications of it. The one thing about it is, Getting the Listener's Choice Award means that the community really came through for us. The, the Fallout community, also the more general audio drama community, really came out and supported us. And that's huge. I mean, one of the things about the Fallout community on the creative side is people really support each other. And even people who maybe aren't necessarily creating things themselves support creators too. And I think this is a, a real illustration of that happening. Now, I guess I can talk about this because the results are out, but we thought that we were in pretty good position to win the listener's choice because they stopped showing the percentages 24 hours before voting closed. And somebody told me, I don't remember who, when they voted, they voted pretty late in the process, that we were up 25% to 20% over the next highest one. And there were six nominees in the category. So that, that was wow. pretty good. I don't remember exactly how many total entries there were. I'm thinking it was around 170,000 total votes, not just for our category, obviously, that's for, for everything. So given the sheer number of people that were voting, it's hard to move 5% in the course of 24 hours. So we figured we were in good position for that. But the silver award, they award a, a gold, silver, and a bronze award in each category. That was definitely not something that we were counting on. We were hopeful, obviously, but that's panel judge, so it's, a, it's a, a whole different kind of ball of cheese. The judging panel consists mostly of people that are really big, you know, like executives and, and uh, higher up folks in companies like HBO and Netflix and companies like that. So these are serious heavy hitters that are going to be looking for quality commensurate with the kinds of stuff that they produce. These companies all produce exceptionally high quality stuff. Mm -hmm. So to get that kind of recognition as well, I mean, that's 
that's almost having your cake and eating it too. Because a lot of times you can get that community support and you can have a strong community backing you up, but it doesn't necessarily get reflected in that kind of peer reviewed, peer judged kind of thing or vice versa. But we got both. And that was, I mean, it was, it was incredibly gratifying to get both of those was something that I certainly wasn't expecting it. I knew it was a possibility, but the fact that that actually happened, I'm not quite able to process it fully yet. But I think another thing that this shows, and, and really this applies to either of those wins, it shows the power of fallout storytelling, and it shows the strength of the world that has been created by all of the creative minds and the studios behind fallout and the world that those stories have created. It resonates and it doesn't just resonate with fallout fans. It resonates with people outside fallout fandom. And I think that's one thing that's been reflected in the listenership of our show. Obviously we have a great deal of community support and that's fantastic, but I specifically constructed the show so that it would be accessible to people outside the fallout fandom too. And that can be a difficult line to walk because you don't want to make it just fallout in name only because that's going to alienate people who are fans of fallout. And it's not really fair. It's kind of uncool because then you're really just taking the name and slapping it on something that is completely not that thing. So it's kind of a bait and switch, but also you don't want to get so deep into fallout lore that if you haven't played one or more or most or all fallout games, you're going to be completely lost. So that was the line I tried to walk. And I think this also shows that I have so far at least been successful in walking that line in a way that the show is enjoyable by people who are big fallout fans and by people who have never heard of fallout before. One other thing that I think is cool, Todd Howard came out, I guess it was last month or maybe in November. And he said the way that they're approaching the Amazon Prime show is they're not telling a story from a game. They're not retelling New Vegas or they're not retelling Fallout 4. They're telling a new story in the Fallout universe that doesn't contradict existing canon. And that was the mm -hmm. exact approach I took. So <laughs> hearing them say that as, as the, the approach that they're taking with their multi-million dollar television show that kind of reinforced, okay, I made the right call there in the way that I wanted to approach it. You mentioned walking the line there, and I think in one of your behind the scenes mini sage, you do reference uh, a review or two of the podcast from people who haven't come from the Fallout background. Are you still getting a lot of feedback from non-Fallout fans about the series? It's hard to say because it could be a matter of confirmation bias, but it seems like a lot of the reviews that I'm getting or a lot of the feedback I get outside of the review process is mostly from people who are not super hardcore fans of Fallout. Some of them maybe have played Fallout there, but they're not super into it like a lot of people in the community are. And there's also people that I hear people say or people tell me, I, I didn't want to give this a chance, but then I listened to it and I'm glad I did because they didn't think they would enjoy something that was based on a video game property and or they thought that it was going to be so arcane and not capital A arcane because that's a great show that they wouldn't be able to understand it. Mm -hmm. But they said, you know, they, they listened to a couple episodes like, okay, I get it. You know, with the context clues, with the setup, the characters are drawn within the show in a way that you don't need to go back and play the game to understand who Scribe Valdez is, for example. I, I imagine that has a lot of impact on the writing. There are perhaps things that you have to explain that you wouldn't explain if it was just directed at Fallout fans. Yeah, definitely. And that's also a difficult line to walk because one of the core tenets of storytelling that is always top of mind for me is show don't tell. You don't want to just dump info on people. You don't want to have somebody who, and they even made fun of this in Austin Powers, who's just Mr. Exposition who comes in and says, oh, well, the Brotherhood of Steel was founded in this year by Roger Maxson and da, da, da. And you go, you go through this whole thing and it's just telling people the backstory that they want to know. So you have to weave that in, in a way, either via context clues, like I said, or sometimes you can explicitly talk about something where you can have an audience surrogate come in who doesn't understand or doesn't know about this particular piece of fallout lore or this particular piece of fallout history and a character needs to explain that to them but you have to be very careful about that and you have to do it in a way that it doesn't feel like you're dumping info so just for those who have got the bingo card out just speaking for yourself are you a new fallout fan or are you an old fan or something in between i guess i'd say in between the, the first fallout game that i played was fallout 4 and i got that right around launch if not at launch back in 2015 Loved it. I think I did five playthroughs, which I'm sure for a lot of listeners is a low number, but I, I did at least five, maybe a couple more. And I really fell in love with it. I fell in love with that game itself and the universe that it took place in. So I sought out other media and learned more about the lore and all that kind of thing. So yeah, that's where I started. And when Fallout 76 came out, I did pre-order that and 
play that. I didn't play the beta. I was on PlayStation. I'm not sure if the beta was available on PlayStation, but in any case, if it was, I didn't play it, but I did play right from launch, but I did take some time off after a few weeks until Wastelanders dropped. Awesome. So for those who haven't heard it, Once Upon a Wasteland, it focuses on the story of Brotherhood scribe Odessa Valdez, who you may recognize from Fallout 76, and Beth Kirby, who is, well, well how would you describe Beth in a relationship with Officer Valdez and what the story's about? So Beth is the, the focus character. She's the character that the audience is intended to follow. She is a vault dweller. And of course, anybody who plays Fallout 76, you are a vault dweller as you start the game and you pop out and you, you make your way in the world. And that's what Beth does. So I thought that was good synergy for people who do play the game because it gives that sort of relatability. And she, like, like any of us who, who play the game, sort of makes her way in her own particular way in the world as she comes out. The backstory that I created for her was that her father and her mother were both living in the vault and they were part of a vault tech training program. Her mother was a diplomat who trained people in conflict resolution, even some world building, like to, to be able to reform a government or some sort of organizational structure, at least after the vault opened and they went out. And her father was a former MI6 officer who trained people in spycraft and intelligence gathering and those kinds of things. So Beth... While she was in the vault, took part in both of those training programs. She did diplomacy training. She did spy training. And she went out in the world with a, with a brief to basically make sure that she did what she could to make sure that the world out there didn't fall any further into chaos than it already had. So that can mean overtly having groups like Foundation and a group of settlers work together. But it can also mean working behind the scenes and working secretly to play factions off each other in a way that will prevent any particular faction, one specific faction, from rising to power if they are either not ready to take that power or maybe if they're not the right faction to be trusted with the society that's growing in Appalachia. In terms of her relationship with Scribe Valdez, she heard the buzz, and this is something that was one of the earliest nuggets of where the idea for the story came from. She heard the buzz about this beautiful scribe that everybody liked that had just shown up in town that everybody wanted to ask out, but nobody could seem to get... To, Nobody could successfully romance, and mm -hmm. she decided to try her hand at it. And that's where our story begins. She engineers a, a meeting between the two in an extreme situation so that she can show off how capable she is and so that she can save the day, and it goes from there. Great. So how did the idea for the story first come about? Like I mentioned, the earliest nugget of the story was when Steel Dawn dropped. A lot of people I noticed on Reddit mentioned that they sort of lamented the fact that you could not romance Scribe Valdez. You could flirt with her. And there were two instances, and I think that these were both in Steel Dawn and not in Steel Rain. But in one, she completely shuts you down and says, I don't think that we should have a relationship like that. And then there's another one where she's oddly receptive and says, I'm much more comfortable working on ultrasight batteries than the human heart, but I'm not one to back down from a challenge. But either way, you couldn't romance her. And everybody liked Scribe Valdez. She's a very good character, voiced brilliantly by Michelle C. Bonilla. So that's where the general idea came from. You can't romance Scribe Valdez in the game, but what if you could? And you use that as the jumping off point. In terms of practical matters, though, in February of 2021, again on Reddit, there was a post seeking voice actors. And I have a background in voice acting. I've been an actor in stage work TV. I've done voiceover narration all that kind of thing for almost 30 years. Although I did take a very long break in the middle there. And it sounded interesting. I love the game and it sounded like an inter interesting role. So I auditioned for the role of Modus in a podcast called The Modus Files. And that was a great experience. And Lawrence, who's the guy who created The Modus Files, he encouraged me when we were talking about character backstory and all that kind of thing to flesh out the story. And eventually it got to the point where he said, you know, you should consider making your own podcast. This is a good idea for a story. You have a lot to work with here. Maybe you should give this a try. And I have a background as a screenwriter, so I knew a lot of the nuts and bolts of that part of it, but I knew absolutely nothing about creating, editing, any aspect of podcast production. So he helped me a lot through that. Some other folks helped me out with, with, with that stuff too. We got to the casting process and we, we launched in October of 2021. So one thing that really does stand out is the show is very female perspective and character heavy, whereas much of video game culture focuses on the male perspective or has female characters either as a plot or a marketing device. 
Was this a conscious choice or is it something that naturally came out in the story? It, it really just kind of came out of the way that the story evolved. One thing that I don't do when I write is I don't write with an agenda and I don't, I don't want to say that I don't try to say anything with my writing because I, I mean, I do. Video game culture is so overwhelmingly male and often treats female characters incredibly poorly, which I don't think is a disputable fact. But I didn't think, well, I'm going to turn that on its head and I'm going to have a video game story that is completely centered around two women and their love story. That's not the way that I approached it. The story organically evolved in that way because Scribe Valdez is a female character. The character of Beth started out as a female character. I could have, if I wanted to, changed that character into a male character and I don't know that I would have approached it much differently. But it's it's what the story dictated and I think it worked out well. But no, it wasn't a conscious decision to go that route. It's what the story told me to do. You're currently in the second season of the show. Do you have a plan for the show long-term, like how Babylon 5 had its five-year plan, or is the plan something that evolves along with the story as you write it? Well, going in, ideally what my thought was, if everything goes perfectly, if we achieve all the success that we want to achieve, then three seasons is the way that I would like to construct the arc. And that's still the way that we're looking at it. One of the things about running a show yourself is I know that there's been cases with TV shows where the people that ran the show had an idea of, okay, I want this to run X number of seasons. And then the network or the studio comes in and says, no, this is extremely popular. You are going to continue. And they don't have mm -hmm. the cachet of Jerry Seinfeld, who's going to say, no, we're not going to do that. Since I'm running the show myself, I don't have those kinds of pressures. I can decide when to stop or whether to continue. So as of right now, that, that three-year plan is still the plan. But when I finished the first season, I did build it in a way in that finale so that it could serve as a season finale or a series finale. And I will probably do that for season two as well. because You never know what's going to happen. It's a great story. It's far more popular than I expected or even realistically hoped that it has been. But you never know what tomorrow may bring. Absolutely. Now, part of what we're trying to do with this series is to help bring focus to the wider Fallout creator community. Are there any other creators that you can think of that you would like to maybe help us bring some more attention to? Boy, the Fallout creative community is ridiculously rich, and it's hard to th it's hard to pour a spotlight on on anybody specifically. But I will do my best. So I did mention Modus Files, which is sort of the progenitor of our show. And it's a fabulous show. And, and one of the cool things I think about the specifically uh, audio drama podcast part of the, the Fallout creative community is each of the shows sort of brings something different to the table. Modus Files dives a lot more deeply into lore and tells story. You know, it's, it's, it's centered on the Enclave. So it, it tells a very Enclave-centric story. It talks, it, I shouldn't say it talks about it, it speaks to how the world operates in shades of gray. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different experience in our show. And then you have something like Chad, which is a, just a brilliant show. I mean, it is, it's amazing. Kenny is, I have no words to describe how amazing Kenny is. Absolutely. Uh, and then you have True Vault Escapades, which you have that, that whole detective noir kind of thing. Almost, you know, I, th I think we saw how that fits in Fallout went with, with Nick Valentine, you know, that perfect noir detective in, in Fallout 4. But, but, the creators bring so many different things to the table. So if, if people like audio fiction, like our show, I cannot recommend Modus Files highly enough. Same thing with True Vault Escapades, and there's a, a spinoff of that right now called The Cage Chronicles, which actually I've been in. There is also Chad, the first among us, and the most popular and the biggest. Among other areas, boy, let me think. There are so many visual artists, because one thing is I am not a visual artist. I cannot, I just straight up cannot illustrate at all. It's just not a thing that I can do. So I really leaned on visual artists to create some of the great art. Our season two art was created by Charo Miami, who's one of the most well-regarded artists that does work in the Fallout community and also one of the best and nicest people you will ever come across. She's fabulous. Our season one art was done by an artist named Darling. She goes by a Darling mess. But really, there are so many people in that space. And there's a lot of great discussion podcasters too, who talk about different topics, mostly lore-based, mostly story-based, or updates on news about the game, those are a great way to stay informed. And, and I'm always fascinated and baffled by the way that they're able to get all that information and then get it out in a way that is concise and makes sense and also enriches our experience playing the game. Because like I said, I've been playing since launch, except for that little break until Wastelanders came out. I play on all three platforms now. So it's great to be able to consume that amount of data. 
there certainly is a lot of it out there. So for those of you who aren't already following you, what are the best ways to follow along with what you're doing? So right now we're most active on Twitter and our Twitter handle there for the show is once upon 76 pod. Uh, that's where it's certainly where we're the most active. We're also on discord. We're, we're a member of a lot of different discords actually, but really most show information, general chit chat and all those kinds of things are primarily handled on the old bird app. And I, I will say if, if anybody wants to get in touch with me personally, they can always shoot me an email. My email address is brad at once upon a And that comes directly to me. So if anybody has comments, questions, concerns, my mailing address, they can send me boxes full of cash, anything like that. Just shoot me an email at that address and, and I'll be there. But th those are probably the two best vectors to, to get in touch with us and to, to see what's going on. Yeah. We'd, we'd like some of those boxes of cash too, please. Well, th thanks very much for joining us, Brad. It's been great to have you. Yeah. Thank you again for having me on. It was a great conversation. I, I appreciate it very much. Next time on the podcast, we'll be talking to Empire Waste, a Fallout 4 mod that will take us to the place where dreams are made of, New York. And we'll explore just how the Brotherhood of Steel fell in Appalachia and Paladin Taggarty along with them. Join us then.